what we wanted to do in this session was just to um, provide a summary of uh, what we heard and, and what we learnt um, during the two days uh, here. And also we had the pre-conference um, on, uh, on Tuesday, so to, to build on that uh, as well. So we've been through this uh, three-day journey. So I'll, I'll ask the panellists to reflect on their uh, thoughts about that and, and what they learnt uh, and how that is uh, significant uh, uh, for them. Um, and then also to talk about, because uh, we're using, I'm using this metaphor of a journey, you know, where, where to next? Where are we going next with this thing? And um, where do we want to take it and what sort of outcomes um, do we want to deliver? And as I've said a few times, what we're trying to do here is to build a common pool of knowledge about how to de deliver better development policies uh, for mining regions uh, and cities. And so to do that, we need to bring together those stakeholders who have an interest in that issue, the private sector, uh, local government, uh, national governments, uh, industry associations, um, universities, uh, community organisations, Indigenous groups. So they all, all these, all these institutions have a stake uh, in this issue, and this, this, these events create a platform that bring those different stakeholders together to engage in dialogue and build that common pool of knowledge. Um, but first of all, I'll, I'll ask each um, of the the panel members, or, or um, Nils Olof and uh, and uh, Peter and Enrique, just to give um, their reflection or, or summary of what they heard and what they learned at this event and, uh, and how do they see this uh, initiative evolving in the future and, uh, and adding value uh, for stakeholders. So, uh, Enrique, do you want to start with that? Well, it, it's always difficult to reflect at the end of a very rich uh, event, uh, trying to summarize all those thoughts, but if, if, if I were to do some reflections uh, also in comparison to the other events we held uh, in Antofagasta and in Darwin. I think the, what strikes me most is that uh, we're trying to uh, a bit, be a bit more forward-looking. We're trying to uh, think about these uh, mega trends. And I think the, the topics that we discussed around the just uh, transition, the uh, digitalization and automation and the attractiveness is a bit more to try to make a reflection upon how to position better uh, the policy framework uh, for some of these regions to face uh, a little bit the, the main challenges that we'll be uh, meeting, not just mining regions, but uh, all regions uh, in particular. And uh, what strikes me most uh, out of some of these discussions is that uh, some of these trends are unavoidable. So having um, an attitude of uh, sort of like trying to, to, uh, to escape on it, I think it's not the right one. What strikes me was a bit the comment that we heard from the CEO of Bollinger uh, at the first day to say, this is, you know, wh whoever doesn't manage this environmental transition is out of business. So it's, it's, it's something that must be taken upon with the right uh, framework and mentality. And of course, when you think about these transitions, um, there's always challenges and opportunities. So we spend quite some time thinking about some of the challenges, but I, I think what, what's important is to, to really uh, understand the opportunities and how mining regions are at the core of some of these. Uh, for example, um, the continued demand that would be coming um, out of the uh, transition to, to a low carbon economy, the demand for new products. And uh, what strikes me is, is also some of the suggestions that were, that were uh, applied. It's not, uh, it's not about changing uh, um, the communities or fixing the communities, but it's, it's, it's how can you make them aware that they, they are part of the future, part of the solution, and how to prepare that framework which comes out for me as one of the most interesting parts. And I don't think that's completely clear ac across all regions. This uh, notion in, in terms of uh, thinking about how, how they can uh, change their mindsets uh, in this process. So for example, in the, in the session that I was with the universities, um, it, it's, it, it also strikes me that there's this changing a perception of the mining sector um, in terms of uh, one that's traditional as a backwardness 
towards when you think about it, uh, the the you know these future trends, it's going to be much more uh, innovative and digital and uh, high tech. And I think uh, that itself will make it a much more attractive uh, um, sector for students. Um, and um, if you put that within a broader context, I think there's another discussion that is to thinking about the role of cities in high density places. Um, there's a lot of discussion about the delocalization of services. Um, so I think there are some important opportunities to really uh, leverage uh, this shift towards more uh, innovation prone, more uh, environmental friendly um, um, processes and, and ways of uh, engaging. And that itself, I think, offers new opportunities to build new technologies to have, if you have a, a mining ecosystem that is more uh, innovative, that is more part of a solution towards this green transition, I think that innovation itself can offer new opportunities in other areas, in other value chains that we don't know yet. So I think uh, the future lies uh, with changing these mindsets, we're, we're thinking about the opportunities, but also it, it means uh, to have a, a much more a strategic um, um, cooperation scheme with universities. I think that's, that's going to be very critical in terms of thinking about the future yeah. of some of these uh, mining regions. And the topics that we discussed before, uh, the attractiveness, how can you bring in the, the talent to your place? Um, in one of the sessions before, I, it struck me that, you know, in Sweden, people don't move where the jobs are, but where they want to live. And I think that's a, that's a, that's the right mindset of how can you make your region a livable place? How can you make it an attractive place? How can you transform the sector into one that is that is uh, that will provide the solutions to some of the main challenges? I think, for me, those are some of the mm -hmm. important uh, issues that are quite different than the other events that we had, which mm -hmm. were thinking more about um, sort of like the, the, the mining and its relation with the communities, with uh, jobs, with uh, governance structure. So I, th I, I, would, I would put my comments around those points. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Enrique. Uh, vo voice from the region, Nils Olof. <laughs> Me? No, no, you, you go. Oh, yep. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was very well spoken. I think I can sign that document. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for a fantastic conference. It has been, you know, for me, very, very good. And also for all the participants, you know, we have got so many contexts. And if we have a problem, you know, there is no, pro no way that we can't solve them. Uh, so if there is a problem, there is always a solution. Once I experienced, in, that was actually in Johannesburg, South Africa. It was a project manager. He said that, I can assure you, if you have a solution, I got the problem. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think it, is, uh, it has been a, a wonderful conference, and I want to thank you for that. And uh, I signed that document, but I would like to add something. And uh, also from the conference, you know, I can, can he also conclude that from all regions, you know, we have more or less the same issues. And uh, one thing that is very important, uh, that is that we have to get something back to the local society. And, and that is a point that I heard, I think, from all regions, that that is essential. And especially, you know, when people talking about mining industry, they are very often they say that it's an old, it's a mature industry, a little bit like low technology, but it's the opposite. It's really high tech, and when we talk about automation, that is something that has been going on for quite a while, but it, is, it will happen now in the near future that we need less people in the mines and in this industry. And that means that it puts new challenges to you know, the education system, that we have to give students you know, a basic education, and then it's up to the company to specialize. For example, also for people that have been driving a, a mining truck, you know, they have to get education and trained, maybe the system 1137. Uh, that they are sitting, you know, behind the terminal instead. But they have the experience from, 
from the mining truck operation. And then they come into a control room that is maybe far away or close to their home. But uh, I think it is a trans transition in the, in the mining industry that we also have to, from, for example, the regions side that we have to plan for. And uh, also, I would like also to stress the climate issue. Uh, we are very much today in Sweden, we are focusing on the climate issue. And I think also that it is so that we have to, in the whole industry, all over the world, we have to think very much on that. And that is a transition, for example, from fossil fuels into electricity and so on. And I think that is something that also the end consumers will demand on the industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Peter. Um, well, we agree with the previous two speakers. Um, as I found in Darwin, uh, I found here in uh, Shaliftyor uh, how similar all our problems are. Um, we're usually a long way away from the main population centres. We're usually in a fantastic part of the environment. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be all beautiful trees like this, but some of our areas are desert areas and they're beautiful in their own way too. And um, so our, our problems are, as you say, uh, uh, supporting our communities with finance and infrastructure uh, and also letting other people know what a great place they are to come to live. And I think this new automation and uh, digitalisation revolution that's happening now is actually going to make that happen because um, you'll be able to drive a truck uh, sitting behind your computer with a mouse and you won't be able to drive one truck, you'll drive four, four or five or six trucks all at once and uh, it'll be a high paid job and it'll be a comfortable job and, uh, and with the money that comes from the mining industry it allows a whole lot of artistic and other ventures to happen and that's what people really really love. People, people love art and they love um, performance and they love uh, culture and, and, and painting and, and all those things that make us human and really in mining areas we can uh, facilitate all that and I think that's important. So uh, I love being part of this larger venture. Uh, I, I think Chris and the OECD are going a great job. It's very important. I think it's done from the OECD so that we have a worldwide um, uh, approach. Uh, people don't realise that um, we're all exporters. We actually produce uh, ore which is exported around the world and so we're actually a, a much more of a family than other parts of the world and even if our proportion of the uh, of the of the uh, G, of GDP is small um, people don't realize how important export income is anybody who sits down and does very little actually contributes to GDP but the people who actually export contribute to the wealth of the country and uh, I don't think that's recognised as well. So I got a lot out of this and I, I think it's great to work together. Love your beautiful area. I think it's, it's, it's uh, fantastic. And um, the OECD is doing a terrific job. Look forward to seeing you again next year. Thank you, Peter. Well, what I'll, I'll try and provide some summary remarks. And then, uh, uh, as I said, we're on a journey. And the next point in the journey or one point is... Um, is uh, your your city of, of Karatha where the event goes next, and uh, and Chris and uh, Peter will say uh, will present some information uh, on that. But the f the first thing is that these are events are are a uh, collective uh, effort. It's a team uh, effort, uh, and there were different people involved in that. Um, I think you know we've got Orsa and Carl here at the front who helped uh, mobilise. Uh, uh, disseminate the message about this event and mobilise uh, participation from uh, from Norbotten. We had Marta, who I don't think is here uh, now, from the region of uh, of Vasterbotten, who played a key role in terms of bringing it uh, together. We had um, uh, our sponsors, uh, Boliden and LKAB, uh, the city of Sheleftio, obviously hosting us and uh, and uh, um, participating in the event, and then. Uh, we also had uh, Celia, who helped a lot of you, well, some of you, uh, get your travel arrangements uh, organised here and has helped us with the event, and, and also Lizanne. Uh, so uh, I'd like uh, those people to all stand up, please, because yeah, especially Lizanne, because she put an enormous effort into making this event happen. So I'd like to... Yeah. And, and also uh, at the event... Uh, uh, you know, in all the dis all the sessions I was in, there was great energy and uh, and and discussion, and uh, that that was all done in a respectful way, and um, I think that was great. So that that really energised people and uh, gave us a lot of good uh, 
uh, knowledge and uh, identification of good practices and and so forth. Um, so I, I, I guess when we go back and look at this issue, um, you know, again, our, our unit of analysis, our starting point uh, is uh, regions and cities that are specialised in mining and extractive industries. And we want to look at the kind of contribution they make to um, national economies, uh, as Peter said, to to the export basket, to the to the GDP of countries, it's very important, and to, to locate these regions within broader debates which are happening globally around uh, the rise of China and its industrialisation, around the shift to a climate neutral economy, because in the end these regions do play a, a critical role in solving uh, some of those challenges uh, of, of the future. Um, it, the, the way that these issues have been framed in the past has been a bit transactional between mining companies and local communities through a social licence to operate or a, or a local co content uh, uh, framework, um, which, is, uh, which, is, which is fine and that has delivered benefits for, for communities, but it still is a bit transactional and narrow. And I think you can still you can see industry kind of uh, leading this debate in a way. We, ha we heard from Anglo-American and their collaborative regional development model. Uh, BHP has a social value framework. So I think these companies are starting to broaden out their, the, the relationship that they have with the regions that they operate in. Um, and what we're trying to do here is to put a bit of a, a framework around that and, and, and say, well, what does that mean in terms of policy? What does it mean for national governments, subnational governments, in terms of how they design policies around uh, different dimensions? And we're really focusing on the three dimensions here of regional productivity and economic diversification, uh, quality of life and attractiveness, and subnational governance and fiscal arrangements. And in the end, you have to get that package right in order for um, mining regions to build prosperous and sustainable uh, economies uh, into the, the future. What we did at this event was to focus on the quality of life and attractiveness uh, pillar. And we split that into two parts. One was about the shift to a climate neutral economy and the, the issue of skills. Now on the climate neutral economy, again, we could see that these regions are strategically important, but in the end, these regions also need a proactive strategy uh, for how they're gonna deal with this, this transition, particularly those that are specialised in hydrocarbons, and so that transition needs to be just or fair. And we also discussed about some of the specific mechanisms that can be put in place, such as smart specialisation to enable the diversification of local value chains to move up the value chain, and also the uh, implementation of uh, the circular economy uh, as, w as well. On the skills part, um, we, again, we talked about attractiveness, uh, making uh, you know, places that are, are attractive, that can retain uh, people, uh, you know, mechanisms that need to be in place to develop human capital, particularly the, the relationships between universities and their local economy and vocational education providers. And also the need to have ICT in place as an, an, as an important enabling uh, infrastructure. But wrapped around all that was a recognition that there needs to be a social dialogue in place. There needs to be a, a platform in place that enables different actors uh, to come together to set priorities, uh, understand what the key problems are and what, this, what, prior, what, what solutions need to be put in place to address them. And importantly, that, 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 those, that, that social dialogue needs to occur in, in local places where, where these activities happen. It's not a social dialogue which should occur um, somewhere else. Now, through this work, what we're, what, we're, what we're trying to get to at the end, I think, is uh, a, a, some guidance uh, and tools um, that the OECD can release to implement um, better regional development policies in a mining and extractives context. Now, what we need to do that, we need a couple of things. One is we need stakeholder and political support. So these events are very important in terms of building and mobilising that community who, who can support that initiative. Uh, the second is to uh, mobilise the evidence and data that we need to make the case for, the, for, these, uh, for these policies. Uh, and that's where the case studies um, and the statistical analysis will come in. And the two things are tied together, and I think that was what was great at this event, is that we could present some of that initial work that we had done in Nutukumpu and North Karelia and here in this region as well. And I think at the future events we want to, um, uh, we'll, we'll also hopefully undertake some further case studies that we can bring in to, to the event because I think that really makes it real and um, enables a, 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 a real discussion about, uh, about policy um, solutions. So um, I think that's, that's it uh, from me in terms of the summary. Um, and uh, thanking uh, those everyone and those key people that made this event happen. So I'll just uh, hand over to Chris and, and Peter who can talk about uh, our uh, next event uh, in, in Australia. So, yep, yep. <laughs> um, 
we get the opportunity. We get the opportunity now because the baton is passing from uh, Sheleftia onto the city of Karatha. So, I'd like to um, use this opportunity to say, first of all, a big thank you. Uh, thank you to the city of Sheleftia. You have really turned it on, and you've set the bar very high. Uh, we, you're going to make it difficult for us to put on an event as good as good as this, but it's a challenge that we're up to, and it's a challenge that we're really going to um, do our very very best at. Well done to Chris and the OECD. Um, this is my first one of these events I've attended. Uh, I didn't know what to expect. It has exceeded my expectations. Uh, I've really found the quality of the dialogue not only in the sessions, but in the breakouts, at the um, at the lunch breaks and the like, where you get to talk to people from such diverse backgrounds uh, and to see that we're all so different but yet all so, so much the same um, has been a really, really phenomenal opportunity. I'm now going to pass over to our Mayor, who's going to tell you what you can expect, what you can expect in the City of Caratha and why you should make the effort next year to come across and join us at the fourth OECD Mining Regions Conference. Thank you very much, Chris. I won't uh, spend too much time. I'll just uh, flick through a few, a few slides here and uh, tell you about Caratha. Uh, uh, Caratha is a city of only 25,000 people. We're quite small. Uh, as I said before, we're 1,500 kilometres north of Perth, which itself is regarded as the most isolated city in the world. Perth is a beautiful city of 2 million people, uh, and we're about 1,500 kilometres north. It's effectively a mining town, Perth, as well. Uh, around Caratha, we have uh, the Barrett Peninsula, known to the native people as Morajuga, and Morajuga is got the uh, densest um, uh, area of rock art in the world. Uh, this is uh, a few, uh, we'll just flick through some of these pictures here too. So um, we have this really very, very old rock, three and a half billion years old the rock is in our region. The Pilbara region has been to the North Pole twice and the South Pole once in the last uh, three and a half billion years. And uh, so it's very old and uh, which is one of the reasons why there's so many minerals. Apart from iron ore and oil and gas, we have um, a whole range of other minerals as well and the latest one that's being exploited of course is lithium and there was three billion dollars worth of lithium exported from the Pilbara last year as well from uh, Port Hedland. Uh, these are shots here of the uh, of the LNG projects we got here. The Karatha gas plant, the Northwest Shelf project, when it was built in the early 1980s, it was the biggest project ever done in the world. $25 billion in the dollars of the day in the early 1980s. Uh, that project is now uh, running down. It's uh, over 30 years old and there's uh, another $40 billion worth of, of uh, oil and gas infrastructure that are now being proposed to feed this um, uh, gas plant here in Karatha. Uh, the uh, the Pilbara, as Chris uh, mentioned in his talk, exports 850 uh, uh, 850 million tonnes of iron ore per year. Uh, second in the world is Brazil, which does 350, but the Pilbara does 850. It's quite remarkable. It's over half the world's production. You have these massive, massive iron ore stockpiles in each of the ports. There's about, there's about um, 12 ports all around the Pilbara. And uh, iron ore ports, we have um, three in the city of Caratha and, and Port Hedland actually exports more iron ore than the city of Caratha too. This is the, some of the uh, landscape around here. This is Millstream National Park. We have uh, three national parks in our region. Uh, Millstream National Park here, this is uh, uh, the type of thing you can actually see. Go, uh, this is right near Caratha here, this is Cleaverville. So we'll have a lot of tidal, uh, tidal inlets um, covered in uh, uh, mangroves. Uh, there's uh, an archipelago of islands, of about 40 islands, just uh, in front of Caratha, which is our, our recreation area. So you can go out and find a beach on your own. We have the highest boat ownership in Australia, which probably means it's the highest in the world. Uh, people love going out there. This is um, this is the old town of Cossack. The first port in Karatha and the Karatha region was actually Cossack. It was uh, established in 18, uh, early 1860s. The first people came up in 1861. Uh, it's now a ghost town, the town of, of Cossack, but there's got these beautiful old um, 19th century buildings which were, we think are terrific. Mountain biking and, uh, and sport in general is, is uh, very popular in a place like Karatha, as you might expect. Uh, so um, we have uh, huge uh, numbers of people play uh, basketball, netball, all sorts of different, uh, football, cricket and other things as well. We have a lovely golf course which looks over Nickel Bay. Karatha's on Nickel Bay there. Is that the 
movie, uh, Chris. So um, just before we start, this is a mo I mentioned that we were doing an advertising program all over Australia to try and change the perception of, uh, of our town as a, as a dirty, dusty mining town where no one wants to live. And um, we are spending $2 million on this program, which is going to go over three years. So we got professionals in to actually do this for us. Uh, and this is the video that we've actually prepared to sell the town to um, the Australia. And we hope we'll uh, sell it to you too. We'll see you all right in Carrara next year. Love to see you. Thank you very much for felt here. It's been beautiful. The Hidden Lagoon. Stairs to the moon. No bars on your phone. A beach of your own. A chance to go wild. To release your inner child. Stars in the millions. Investment in the billions. A place to belong. Community. is calling. <laughs> so Karatha is calling and it's calling you yeah. and we want to see all of you in Karatha next year. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, guys. Sorry. Um, and so the immediate next steps for us is we will produce uh, some proceedings of this event. When we circulate those proceedings, we'll also circulate a call to action, which is a sort of pledge that we've created for this initiative. So we would welcome your organisations to formally sign up to that. Uh, so it helps, again, helps us build this community of uh, organisations. Um, and then soon we will announce the details for this event in Karatha as well, most likely in the middle of next year. So thank you. <laughs>